morning. It is really lovely to be with you all. I'm Pastor Jennifer, one of the ministers here at our church, and it's just a joy to gather together. Uh, it's a three-day weekend, I know, so if you're watching online and you're not here with us, but you're there with us, really glad that you're taking a minute to join us online. And if it's your first time here, you're checking us out, um, or if you're checking us out online, that's what people do now when they're looking for a new church, is you pull it up on the web first before you even go there. Um, it's my prayer that you feel met by God's spirit and, recip uh, and re receive the love of God here in this time and place that we gather together. This is um, the second part of a very short series, this exclamation mark thing that we're doing, looking at a couple of these sort of exclamatory statements that were found in the Gospel of Matthew. We've been in the Gospel of Matthew since Christmas and will be there until Easter. So today we're looking at a story that occurs in the 17th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. However, it's also in all of the other synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is the transfiguration of Christ, um, and it is Transfiguration Sunday, which is usually the last Sunday before Lent begins. Lent begins on Wednesday, y'all. And um, before I forget, because we did the first service, on your way out today, this looks like a CD, right? So appropriate for today, you'll see why. Um, there's a little card with some information about our Lent worship series, the essentials of Jesus. And on the back is all things Ash Wednesday. So that is Wednesday this week. You can find the service times here, details about ashes to go. Um, we're looking forward to sharing this season with you. So we are in the Gospel of Matthew, and I invite you to hear these words from the 17th chapter. I am glad that you're here. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I'm really happy to be here, but I am a little tired. I was telling Shelly that morning came quickly for me um, because last night I attended my first Spring Branch Elementary School World of Fundraisers type of thing. Uh, my, my middle goes to Nottingham, and so they are really excited. We are really excited because they're getting a brand new school building, and this is the last year they're in the old school building. So the theme for the whole auction and the whole event was old school. So here for it. Um, so you can even see they, they made a pun, like, welcome to the night. They're the Nottingham Knights, 1990s. It is a good time, I think, to be a child of the 80s and 90s. That nostalgia is just coming back with a fury. They encouraged um, thematic dress, which is actually really easy to find right now. <laughs> and so I am completely rocking. You know, I channeled my inner Delia's catalog, and I have the short overalls with tights and my fake Doc Martens. And I had the little butterfly clips in my hair and like the biggest scrunchie I could find. <laughs> yin yang earrings. Um, my husband Brandon is wearing uh, a yin yang shirt and a flannel, of course. I made him do his hair like all the boys did in the 90s, like with like, you know, parted down the middle and like the arch. We had a lot of fun. Um, they had, a, uh, they had an airbrush artist there. Y'all remember, this is like where the elder millennials are gonna self-identify with me. <laughs> going to Astro World, they always had those like super cool airbrush t-shirts and hats. I always wanted one of those and never got one, but I did get one last night, and that is $20 well spent. 
The music was a lot of fun. I uh, danced like a maniac, and I think, thankfully, there's only one person here in this room that was there that will attest to that. But uh, I'll be a fool for the cause of, of children any day, right? Um, yeah, so it was, it was just a blast. It was especially fun for me because I love old school hip hop music. Growing up, um, in the time and place that I did, my closest circle of friends uh, that I hung with the longest and maybe got in like, the most trouble with um, were, uh, was, was also a more diverse group. And so there were some of us from the one high school and from the other high school. And, and that was the music we listened to. Love hip hop. And what I always liked about it, I think is so cool, is like the sampling. Sampling is one of the hallmarks of hip hop music. Um, and so if you don't know who, what I'm talking about, if you want to occupy your afternoon um, in a really fun and, and uh, fascinating way, there's a website called whosampled.com. So it's a, it's a sort of tradition. It's like the DNA of music gets passed down through new music. For example, Notorious B.I.G., whom I share a birthday with, his song Hypnotize, which is not safe for work, um, sampled la di da di di by um, Doug E. Fresh and Slick Rick, and also sampled the song Rise by Herb Alpert from the late 70s. The hypnotized song came out in like the mid, the mid 90s, right? And also sampled a song by the Crystals that you've heard before, no doubt. Like it's that Do Run Run song that came out 34 years before Biggie released Hypnotize. That's sampling, right? You can hear the threads of music, the tracks that get layered up in a new album. Another example, Missy Elliott in 2002 sang Work It, great song. She sampled Peter Piper from Run DMC, which was a song from 1986, and she sampled Heart of Glass by Blondie. So the sampling is like broad. It's not just all from one genre. It's broad sampling, and it, it really, if you love music, like gets the whole spectrum going, and it's a little nod to like artists that influenced modern artists. So this is still a thing, it happens a lot, and I was always fascinated by that. Because if you hear it, you're listening to a new song, and you're like, hey, that sounds like that other song. And then you go and you're like, oh, that is that other song. And it's just a really cool little like homage and like continuation of good music in new music. A couple of years ago, I was a counselor at Texas Youth Academy. And we got to hear a lecture by Brent Strawn, who is a Bible scholar, a professor at Duke Divinity School. And his entire lecture was about how the sampling in hip hop helps us understand the sampling in the Bible. So the Gospel of Matthew is a perfect example because throughout the Gospel of Matthew, there are samples from Deuteronomy, from Exodus, from the Psalms, from the prophets, those tracks of God's love and faithfulness get layered up upon layer in the Gospel of Matthew. Today is a perfect day to dive into this topic because today our scripture from Matthew isn't taking us back to the old school, but it is taking us back to the New Testament. Um, and so what I want you to do is kind of hold in mind, keep that, keep that uh, story of the transfiguration from Matthew's gospel in your ear while you listen to two passages from the book of Exodus, way back at the beginning of the Bible. Um, this is chapter 24, verses 12 through 18, and also th chapter 34, verses 29 through 35, and it's going to be up here for you too. So listen for the sampling. Listen for those tracks that you already heard in the new release of Matthew's gospel. The Lord said to Moses, come up to, the, me, come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. Then Moses set out with Joshua his aide, and Moses went up on the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. 
For six days the cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And then there's 10 chapters of Moses receiving the law and the instructions from the Lord, and we pick it up again in 34. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went back in to speak with the Lord. This mountaintop experience that Moses has on Sinai and that the Gospel of Matthew tells us the disciples had with Jesus are remarkable. And I hope that you heard some of the threads there There's a cloud that descends, just a few go up, and the Lord's glory causes radiance with those who encounter God. Mountaintop experiences is something we talk about from time to time. Um, You might have had some of your own that you can think of. The fancy theological word for that is theophanies, basically when God shows up, when God is observable. In Matthew, that looks like the glowing, face-shining, parallel, and not only are those parts of the story parallel between Matthew's gospel and Exodus, but also there is an addition of some, some people that come on the mountain. Elijah is there, symbolizing the, the word of the prophets, and Moses, of course, who was there the first time around, shows up amongst the disciples and Jesus when he is transfigured. And on these mountaintop experiences, when God is is observably present, right, you get a sense of God dwelling in a place, and there's this invitation to stay long. Moses stays up on that mountain for a long time. Jesus and his disciples were up there for quite a while, too. The Bible scholar Walter Brueggemann says that at the center of the Sinai tradition is an act of contemplation, an odd, silent, respectful look at God. That mountain that James and John and even Moses and Elijah there have this experience of of Jesus becoming radiant, the face of God, the very flesh that God put on, being there, and the glory of God descending is that odd, silent, respectful look at God. And so they are caught up in it. We read that Moses and Elijah speak with Jesus, but we don't know what they say. But James and John just seem to be there, caught up in the awe, silent, observing the glory. But Peter, gets so swept up in what's happening that he wants to do something. Like, he misses the point. He's like, I need something to do with my hands. This is just too much, right? It's like as if he wants to skip ahead of the experience and go straight to the souvenir shop instead. I have gone to the Louvre before, just once in my life. My husband, Brandon, goes to Paris more often than me. We'll talk about that another time. Um, But, you know, it's the requisite thing to go and look at the Mona Lisa, for example. And there's always a long line. um, but, But you could just skip that entirely and just go to the museum gift shop. And you could see postcards or posters of these works of art. But there's something instead about being there and experiencing it. Have you ever taken a kid to, like, the zoo or the science museum? And instead of, like, actually seeing the animals or seeing these huge 
fossils put together to form these ancient creatures that walked on our earth. They just want to go to the gift shop, right? But Peter's there a little bit. And so he's fussing, and he's caught up in the frenzy. He sees what's happening. He's like, it is so good to be here, God. Lord, it is good to be here. Why don't I build a booth for you and for Moses and for Elijah? We can capture this experience. But while he's still speaking, God's voice from the cloud interrupts him with instructions for Peter and for us. Because when we read a gospel story that includes the disciples, we are very much the disciples. We get it wrong a lot of the time. We get it right every now and then. But Peter is very much a stand-in for us here. And those instructions that God gives are, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. Your only task right now is to listen. There's a Bible commentator, Gary Charles, and he wrote that in our modern era, which elevates frenzy to the level of an idol, these awe-filled verses in Exodus 24 and in Matthew 17, they invite readers to do nothing but sit quietly in the awesome presence of God, to recognize God in our midst and to listen to him. It's surprisingly hard to do nothing sometimes, right? It's so easy for us to get caught up in the frenzy. Our lives are so busy. They swirl around us that we so often miss the glory of God unfolding around us. So how do we follow those instructions that God gave directly to Peter and directly to us there on the mountaintop? How do we listen to God? How can we make it our practice to resist the frenzy? And in the words of the psalmist, be still and know that God is God. I think when we gather and worship every week, that's a wonderful practice for being still and knowing that God is God. Because our only task when we're here is to have our eyes open, our ears open, our hearts open to what God is about to do, to what God has done, and who God is to listen. And we pour that out in praise. There's nothing else we have to do when we gather here. It's one hour, it's one time, one place every week where we can come and be open to God's presence. God's presence that is always around us, but that is so easy to overlook in our busyness. That's one way that we might learn to listen to God. We might go even more old school and make room for the contemplative tradition, the resting practices of our Christian tradition. Contemplative practices just mean resting, dwelling with God, being in God's presence. So things that the desert mothers and fathers in the first few centuries of the church practiced, they were a group of people who resisted the frenzy of their day and age, which even in the first couple of centuries of this time period, the first and second century after Christ, was a difficult thing for them to navigate. So they, they, to resist the frenzy, left the busy villages and cities and went out to be an intentional community in the desert and to practice being in the presence of God. And so they teach us things like Christian meditation and centering prayer where we don't even have to find the right words to pray or put words to our prayer at all. We can sit in God's presence and simply ask for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us. It's so simple, but it can be so challenging. Perhaps you look for times of spiritual silence or opportunities for retreat to help you listen to him. Maybe this is a season for you to take up a fast from social media. There are so many ways that we might think and be invited to go on up to the mountaintop, even in the midst of our everyday lives, so that we might tune our ears to hear what God is saying to us today. Prayer is an essential part of that, and we pray all the time here. But just rest in the fact that knowing sometimes we don't need to do or be or say anything in particular in our prayer for it to be 
the most effective means for us to draw near to God. Years ago, the journalist Dan Rather interviewed Mother Teresa, and he asked her, you say that you pray all the time. What do you say to God? And she replied, I don't say anything. I listen. And that response kind of knocked Dan Rather off his footing a little bit. And after he regrouped his thoughts, he said, well then, what does he say to you? And she replied, he doesn't say anything. He listens. And there's this fairly long pause after that. And then Mother Teresa speaks again. She says, and if you can't understand that, I cannot explain it to you. She says that not because she's so high and holy, although in that image she does have the halo, she's been sainted, right? Which is, when you're looking at art, why do we draw halos around the figures in artwork? It's a sampling back, it's, it's connecting to that track of what happens at the transfiguration, that this is someone who spent time in God's presence and who is observably different because of it, who shines forth the light of Christ, right? I don't think she said that because she was so high and holy and better than all of us. It wasn't to be snide. I think that she said that because when we experience the presence of God and when we observe the glory of God that is all around us, but we take time to stop and to rest and to listen to God, that those experiences become simply indescribable. So she can't explain it to Dan Rather. And likewise, maybe you can't explain mountaintop experiences that you've had. We can get close, we can try, and we should. It's part of how we share our faith with other people. And so think for a moment today, what is the thing that takes you back to one of those times when you were so aware of God's presence and had a mountaintop experience, had one of those inbreakings of God's glory? What was that moment when you first heard the voice of God speaking to you, when you saw God's face, when you felt the love of God reaching into your life and into your heart, and it was real to you. Prayer is not meant to put us into a frenzy. It's not about having the right words. I love the invitation that prayer gives us to listen to God and to draw near and to fall in love once again with our Lord. Richard Foster, who is a great person to read if you're curious about contemplative practices, he's very readable and very approachable and very knowledgeable. But I love what he says about real prayer. He says, real prayer comes not from gritting our teeth, but from falling in love. So I mean that really. Think today about what is that experience that you can touch back on when you felt the love of God, when you heard God's voice, when you knew it was real. I think back to a time when I was in my first couple of semesters in college. I, went to, I first went to a tiny two-year Methodist school in Jacksonville, Texas, called Lawn Morris College. Not Lawn Mowers College, <laughs> Lawn Morris College. Um, and it's no longer around. It folded, sadly. Um, but that was where I began to hear God's love for me and God's, I saw God's glory in the faces of friends and in, and in the discernment of a call. And one of the things that I did there in my first couple of years is I was a part of a student-led worship service called Stepping Stones in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Every worship service had to have a cool name. So we were part of Stepping Stones, and against somebody's better judgment, I was on the praise team, and we would sing those good old songs like, Shout to the Lord, Lord, I lift your name on high, like with all the motions, right? Some of y'all remember. Um, Over the mountains and the seas. And sometimes my job there, it's like this is how old school this was, sometimes my job there was to change the lyrics for the song so everyone could sing along. Um, by switching out the transparency on the overhead projector. This is a while ago. The glory of God, though, was in that space. 
It was a place where we weren't distracted by classwork or by other things that were stressing us out. We weren't caught up in the frenzy. We were able to hear that invitation to just stop and listen. And we would stay long hours in that chapel, my friends and I. We would occupy pews. We would just rest in God's presence. So as a college student, being, home, uh, being away from home for the first time is overwhelming to suddenly be responsible for yourself. And so having that place where I could rest with God was a complete game changer. That was something I remember. So what is your mountaintop experience? What is that place that takes you back? Maybe it's when you're here in this place and we sing songs of praise to God. In a, in a moment, Campbell and Ken are gonna come out and play a little bit of a new song called Old Church Basement. I encourage you all to find the whole song out there. It's Maverick City um, worship band that's becoming um, pretty well known and recognized. And they've got great music. In this song, the refrain is, it's an old hallelujah with a new melody. Up in that mountaintop experience with Jesus and James and John and Peter, that's an old hallelujah that echoed back centuries past in a new melody. And in that song, Old Church Basement, you hear there's a little sampling of those good old worship songs that I would sing in the chapel at Lawn Morris College. And we're called to make ourselves aware of God's presence and God's glory because it is all around us and it's so easy for us to miss it. But friends, God is calling us up there and saying, this is my son, my beloved. Listen to Jesus so that you know that you are my beloved, and in you I am well pleased. Would you pray with me? Oh God, your glory shows up everywhere, all around us. When we gather here to worship, we're on holy ground, and you are moving in powerful ways among us. But when we leave this place, God, you are still with us, and I just pray that you would help all of us to be aware of your presence that you would create spaces, even if they're very small and very short, where we can take time to rest in your presence and listen. Listen for the word of love. Listen for the word of grace. And listen for the truth of how loved we are and how you and your presence in our lives makes us different changes us, causes us to reflect your light. Be with us and help us to remember, God, that prayer is about falling in love with you. We're so grateful, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.